Hi there folks and welcome back to our discussion of climatic, geomorphic, and geodynamic processes in the geodynamics course. Here in lecture number four on this topic we're going to talk about how we model the interactions between climate, erosion, and tectonics. So we have two goals in the lecture. First we're going to talk a little bit about tectonic models. We could probably do an entire set of video lectures about the tectonic models, but here we'll talk about the main concepts involved in modeling tectonics, and then we'll look in a little bit more detail at the equations that govern how erosion is modeled in mountain systems. Now, as we've already uh, seen in some respects, there's a handful of things that we can observe in the field about mountain systems, but if we really want to look at the interactions between processes and how um, their interactions evolve over time, we need a tool that can simulate these processes over long time scales, and in this case, uh, numerical geodynamic models are a very well suited tool for exactly a task like this. We've already seen this picture here of the convergence of two continental crusts in the formation of a mountain system between the two. And if we want to simulate all of these different processes, such as erosion at the surface, sedimentation, and all these faults and different things that are occurring within the continental crust as it's being deformed, we basically need two components. We need first a tectonic model, or this is sometimes referred to as a mechanical or even thermal mechanical model because it models not only thermal processes but also the mechanical deformation of the lithosphere, so faulting and these kind of things and a surface process model where we can simulate the erosional processes and sedimentation that take place at the Earth's surface. Now, as I mentioned already, in our discussion of tectonic models, we're going to keep things simple and just talk about the main components in a tectonic model. If we want to study these kind of um, active tectonic settings, advection of heat is a major consideration um, for any kind of reasonable model because we have erosion at the Earth's surface and there's a significant amount of mass transfer as a result of erosion which advects heat. Now also of course we would have to be able to simulate the conduction of heat and heat production so we need some kind of thermal model. We also need some basic rheological flow laws so this could be things like plastic or frictional plastic behavior of uh, the materials within the model, viscous flow, and for the viscous flow in particular, uh, we also want to be able to have temperature dependent material properties such that the viscosity decreases with depth the way that we believe it works in the Earth's crust. We also simulate things like the surface forces and body forces, so frictional interactions between uh, different parts of the model or gravity forces, so if there's differences in density, um, those will also potentially drive deformation of the crust in the model or of the lithosphere in the model. And typically for these tectonic models they're driven by velocity boundary conditions. Um, and so this would mean that you would have some set of velocities defined on the sides of the model such that oftentimes you have material being fed in from one side of the model and perhaps the other side fixed so that you have collision within the middle of the model. Um, additionally, deformation will be driven by gravity, such as I have already mentioned about things where there's differences in density or if there's, um, you know, the topography itself and the, the slopes at the surface could potentially drive deformation as well. Now we can talk in a little bit more detail about modeling erosional surface processes uh, and how they change the elevation at the surface. So if we consider our elevation of the Earth's surface to be represented by the letter H, we're now going to look at things that modify H, the elevation of the surface. And there's basically two different types of processes we need to consider. There's short range processes, and these are going to be erosional processes that take place on length scales of perhaps a single hill slope. So from the ridge down to a river, for example. And so one of the main processes that we'd be simulating with this kind of um, erosion model would be things like hill slope diffusion. This could be 
uh, soil creep, if you're familiar with what that is, or other processes that basically cause mass to diffuse down slopes. The relationship looks like this, where we basically say dH dt, the change in elevation with time, is a function of some um, constant Ks, which includes not only climate, but also the substrate, the, the rock, or um, the mass uh, at the surface upon which erosion is acting, times the, the second derivative of the elevation with respect to distance. So this is basically the curvature of the Earth's surface. And so we see here that we would have kind of a classic diffusion type um, equation, such that steeper slopes will result in faster transport of, or faster lowering of the Earth's surface. Now for longer range processes, we're talking about things where we're transporting material along the length of a river channel, for example. And so if we were to look at this river channel, we can kind of break the, the transport processes within the river channel into a number of different parts. First off, at any given position within the landscape, we have some potential to transport sediment. And so we can calculate this QF, which is a sediment flux that is basically our capacity to transport sediment. And so if you think about this, you go to any given part or any given point on a river, there's a constant in here, KF, that we won't worry about. But there's basically two things that are important in terms of determining how much sediment the river can carry. One is the discharge, that's the how much water is flowing through the river, and the other is the slope of the river channel. Those two things are basically going to determine how much sediment the river can carry, such that if you've eroded material upstream and um, it's being carried down the river, you know, the question is can this river continue to carry that sediment load or does it need to deposit sediment because there's more sediment in the river than the river is capable of carrying. So that's what this, you know, that's what this equation is about. Here, it's basically our capacity to transport sediment. Down here is essentially what's going to happen in terms of changing the elevation of the Earth's surface. And the main thing to focus on here is that we take the difference between the local sediment flux and our potential to transport sediment, and that determines whether or not we have sedimentation or erosion. And so if this term is positive, it's going to mean that we're going to be um, eroding and if this so if this difference right between our capacity and the uh, sediment flux that if that's a positive term because of the negative sign here that means we're going to be lowering or have a negative dhdt if this qf is larger than our capacity to transport sediment that means that there's more sediment in the river than we can carry and so we have to deposit sediment in that case so dhdt would be positive, which means there would be sedimentation and the surfaces would, uh, the Earth's surface would rise up. And the other thing in here is this LF, which is just a length scale term that's in there to be scaling um, the length scales over which erosion or sediment deposition uh, take place. And so that's just another constant that's in there. And so this is our essentially our river incision and river transport model. So that's it. Those are our main components to this kind of geodynamic model. And what we'll look at in the next two video lectures are some examples of how these geodynamic models work and what we can use them to understand about the coupling of erosion, tectonics, climate, and topography.